Hello everyone and welcome back to the third season of Color Spotlight. I know it has been quite some time since the last episode, so thank you for being patient with me. For those of you who are finding my channel for the first time, or if it's just been so long that you've forgotten, Color Spotlight is the series in which I explore watercolor pigments, how they interact with other colors, and demonstrate using them in a painting. Today we're going to be looking at Paraline Maroon. According to handprint.com, paraline colors have been used since the early 1900s as vat dyes and were first sold as commercial pigments in the late 1950s. They are non-toxic, usually lightfast, transparent, highly staining, and non-granulating colors, but they are limited to a range of scarlet, red, maroon, purple, and green. We've already taken a look at paraline green in this series and we'll be taking a look at paraline violet later in season 3. Paraline Maroon PR179 specifically is a deeply valued color that ranges from a deep red to an earthy reddish brown hue. This color excels at making flesh tones, muted secondaries, and dark tones, but you won't want to use this color for applications such as trying to mix bright oranges or purples. The intensity of this color varies by brand, but one thing I wanted to show you before we get into the brand comparisons is that this pigment goes through a massive drying shift, losing both saturation and value as it dries. I also noticed a lot of white speckles showing through the paper. I did run out of the Canton XL cellulose paper that I used to film this series with, but this is on arches, and both on the arches and I tried on Canton Moulin de Roy as well, this effect happened. It does lessen when you add future layers of pigment, but it is something to note. The speckling is generally tied to the sizing on the paper, but some pigments and formulations are more prone than others. From the swatches that I have at the ready, we're going to start off with the most intense versions of this watercolor first, ranging down to the more neutral and lightly valued versions. First up, we have the darkest, smoothest, and most saturated version from Winsor & Newton. This color is the deepest and most intense version that I have to show you in a hue that reminds me of a garnet gem. It also exhibits the least amount of the white speckling that I mentioned earlier. Next up is Da Vinci's version. This color is less red than Winsor & Newton's version and not quite as intense, but it does glaze beautifully and nearly matches the former swatch in its second layer. M. Graham's Maroon Paraline is very pigmented, but this is where we begin to see PR179 shift from what I would call a deep red into an earthier red, in my opinion. There is noticeably more brown in this version, and the texture is also similar to other M. Graham paints that we've looked at before, like the Anthroquinone Blue, where it has this texture, but it's not really granulation. Still among the versions that I feel layer exceptionally well, but even less saturated, is Daniel Smith's version. This subtle reddish brown is akin to a darker, more transparent, and less granulating version of an Indian red. Dropping off considerably in value and intensity, we have Mission Gold's version. If you look at this watch carefully, you can see that this one doesn't flow like the other versions and had to be manipulated to fill the swatch card. This is more common in Mission Gold colors, as we talked about in the updated version of the Top 10 brand video. Holbein rounds out our swatches for this video. This version flows better than the Mission Gold, but notably has more orange undertones, and oddly enough, has a slight granulation to it. It's fine in its own right if you're looking for those types of properties, but if you're looking for a PR179, this version is way different than the other ones that I have here. For the color mixing portion of this video, I will be using Da Vinci's Paraline Maroon. It was interesting coming up with colors to mix with a deep reddish brown that you haven't already seen in other videos, such as the obvious choice of Hansa Yellow Deep, which would make the brightest oranges possible. However, instead, for the first pairing, I chose to use Yellow Ochre. This combination makes some really beautiful peachy light skin tones, as well as some warm and subtle earthy yellows. Next up, I picked kind of an odd one. I really wanted to show this pigment off with another highly granulating earth tone. I almost went with Pimentite Genuine, which is a really, really deep reddish brown color, which makes these really cool textured reds, but I wanted to go for a little bit more range, and so I chose Lunar Earth. This is still a bit of a specialty color from Daniel Smith, although it's not part of the Primatech line. This pairing makes for some gorgeous granulating earth tones that would be really lovely to include on a desert landscape palette. You can make some really pretty deep pinks and fuchsias if you mix this color with quinacridone rose or magentas, but in this limited range of colors, I wanted to go with something a little bit more towards the purple. I used dioxazine violet to mix some beautiful deep brick red tones, desaturated purples, and dusky lavenders when tinted out. 
I picked both a dark and a light blue for this mixing section, starting with anthraquinone or indenthrine blue. We can get some even more desaturated purples from this pairing that range from that purple into a deep midnight blue, an indigo, and eventually a warm but almost stormy type sky blue. The lighter blue that I used for this was cerulean. When mixed with the Perilee maroon, it creates desaturated blues and grays. These two colors separate into the red and blue components on the paper, which I just love for interesting grays and animal portraits. The muted sky blues here are also really stunning. Finally, we have Perylene Green. I like the pine greens that you can get from this mixture, but I don't feel like the line of swatches here really shows the true potential for how dark this mixture can get. At the end of this line, you'll later see me put a darker swatch, which is a warm black made from this pairing. To finish off the page, we have our normal demonstrations for a wet on wet dispersion, layering, lifting, and softening off. This pigment and particular brand has a moderate flow, glazes well, is staining, and softens off really well. I even added way too much water on that last section and it didn't violently bloom or get out of control. This is on cotton paper, so it might not handle as well on cellulose, but it does get a thumbs up for that. I will add one extra note here that I have a theory about Perylene colors when it comes to scanners, if you're reproducing your artwork or saving them on your computer. The color that has always been completely butchered for me is Perylene Green. I always have to edit it in post-processing, but I also had a bit of trouble scanning this red and having it reflect accurately, so I'm curious to see if it is a Perylene thing, and we'll see how it goes when I try and do Perylene Violet later in this season. I usually try to paint polished, finished pieces for each of these videos, but I was having a hard time finding an animal that I wanted to use this color on and ultimately decided to go with two sketches instead of one finished piece. Both sketches really heavily favored the neutrals that this color can mix, which I know isn't the most super exciting for everyone, but I just love the grays and the blacks and my heart told me to go with it, so I did. I still tried to add pops of desaturated purples and oranges where I could to show you the range of Perilene Maroon. For the first sketch, I drew a flying rock dove, or what most people here in the US just call pigeons. The anatomy ended up being pretty askew due to the angle of my paper in relationship to my eyes, which y'all know I don't like sketching on camera because it makes me nervous in the first place, but at least I'm giving you a little something something and I will try not to make my next pigeon with a head that is far too big for its body. The grays in this piece mix from Perylene Maroon and Cerulean Blue border on Lavender and Periwinkle, making for some really lovely earth tones, I think. To keep with a really natural palette, I used Yellow Ochre to mix a green with the Cerulean, which is the only color in either of these demos that contains no Perylene Maroon. And I mixed a desaturated purple using more of the maroon in that blue mixture for the neck. I should definitely mention that I was using the M. Graham colors for this piece, but the Windsor or Newton or Da Vinci Perylene Maroon would have been a better choice to give me more versatility in mixing. I had grabbed for this palette because I had the true cerulean on it and wanted to use that color, and because the giant porcelain pot that I have is difficult to film with, but I should have opted for my Da Vinci or Windsor Newton palettes and settled for alternate supporting colors, especially given that this is the star of the piece, but hindsight is 2020, right? Hopefully y'all can forgive me for that, but just keep that in mind when you're picking your own version of this color to work with based on what mixtures you want to create. The eye and feet were painted from yellow ochre and perylene maroon with more of the former for the eye and more of the latter for the feet. The dark grays and blacks were added by mixing anthraquinone blue to that gray mixture. I think my favorite part of this entire piece was the back wing and doing all that little feather texture that leads up to the outstretched wing. It was a lot of fun. If you missed my last announcement video and want to learn more about creating feathers or fur or scales, check out my new Skillshare class on animal textures and I'll pop a link in the description below.
I did want to finish off this piece by adding a little bit more influence from the Paralene Maroon, so I added a peachy black splash behind the bird as if it were flying during the twilight hours. The second demo shows off more of those oranges and dark tones that we can get with this color. It's a sketch of what I think is a red-headed Rakugama, which is a lizard with an orange head and a bluish, grayish, blackish body. This whole genus of lizards, by the way, are freaking gorgeous, and their range of colors on some of them are amazing, so if you like painting reptiles, I highly recommend checking them out if you haven't already. I had done my primary sketches for this piece with the Da Vinci version of Paralene Maroon, and again, I should have stuck with that, but since I was using the browner version from M. Graham, there is going to be less saturation in the face than I would have liked or intended to have. However, I did use nickel quinacridone gold rather than a yellow ochre to add as much liveliness and brightness to the piece as possible. The blacks of the body were initially mixed with Paralene Maroon and Anthroquinone Blue, but later you'll see me add more pops of color by using Cerulean Blue. This will help bring out the oranges more by adding that complementary color. I had a lot of fun with this lizard overall, and I feel like it was a much better representation of what this color is capable of. We're going to round out this video with the scans of both of these sketches, as well as the thumbnail sketches that I did while planning for them. And to be honest, I definitely prefer that little two minute pigeon to the one that I finalized, but I am rather happy with the way our little lizard friend came out. Don't forget, if you want to learn more about animal textures, including feathers and scales, you can check out my new Skillshare class. 
I do hope that you enjoyed this episode in the Color Spotlight series, and thank you so much for your patience as it took me forever to get it to you. Let us know in the comments below if you enjoy using this color, and if so, what your favorite mixing combos or applications for it are. As always, a special thank you to my incredible patrons for all of their support, both for me and this series, and a thank you to all of you for watching, liking, and commenting. If you'd like to see more in this series, as well as other watercolor content in the future, be sure to subscribe to the channel. And until next time, my friends, happy painting.